Right, well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being patient while we get started. Um, as you can see, it is the first Sunday of Advent. I expect, without dwelling too much on it, 2020 has been a different year than probably any of us have ever experienced before. It seems like um, looking forward to Christmas has come around really quickly. And as it says there, I quite like this picture. It says Advent, the season of hope and expectation. I mean, we're not of a church tradition where we tend to light Advent wreaths and candles, but in the normal tradition, there's four candles. And I'll explain the fifth one in the picture. So week one would be a candle to think about hope, which we're gonna to do today. Then week two would be peace. Week three would be joy. And week four would be love, which would be the Sunday before Christmas. If you have the five candles and you add the white one, fifth Sunday after Christmas would be for Christ. But we're going to think about hope this morning and we're going to hopefully encourage ourselves in God as we do that. Here's a good verse to start with. One of my favourite verses, it's Paul's letter to Titus. And this is part of verse two of the first chapter. And it says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. And that's the hope that we enjoy this morning, the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie. And it's mind boggling, isn't it, to think that he promised that even before he made time when there was just eternity he just promised that for us um it is it is advent i'm going to pick the most traditional advent hymn to start with it's o come o come emmanuel i've had two versions wondering whether to play this one starts with the traditional words and then they've modified the words a bit um, it's Sovereign Grace Music, which we've enjoyed, where they did their new version of Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I think this is a really, really lovely version of it. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and the ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here Until the Son of God Oh, come, my great high 
Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come with gratefulness, thankfulness in our hearts. We come in worship because of how great you are. We think of your great love. We sent your Son, Emmanuel, God, to be with us. Lord Jesus, we think that you had that glory with your Father before the world was formed by your word by your power, when you spoke, the worlds came into being. And yet you humbled yourself. You became a servant. You became one of us. Veiled your glory. And took that humanity and Godhead, the cross, to die in our place. And Lord, we're humbled as we think about it. The greatness of your love. The depths to which you went so that you could come and dwell in our hearts and one day take us to be with you where you've prayed that we will be forever, like you, with you, serving, working with you. Lord Jesus, this is grace that we cannot understand, love that is so broad and high and deep, but we struggle to grasp it even though through your spirit you have poured that love into our hearts. Even though you've made available to us the same power that raised you from the dead. As we come now with hope in our hearts, we pray that we would experience that hope, peace, a joyfulness from you in our spirit as we contemplate your coming. Your coming for us the first time and that you promised to come back. Bless us now as we share this time together. Bless those who will look later um, when the video is published. I encourage us, we pray now in Jesus' name. So quickly through um, notices, there's not too many. It is the youth group rock solid on Wednesday at 7.45. So if you get the opportunity to pray for the uh, young people and for Andy, myself and Buff as we lead that, that would be appreciated. That's on Wednesday. Of course, this week we come out of the current lockdown and into tiers. Um, most of the East Midlands is in tier three. That does mean we can meet back at church. We'll send out final confirmations, but the intention as things stand is that we will be back in church next Sunday. 
it is tier three restrictions will apply and we'll have to be very careful to keep to the social distancing guidelines and um, that no mixing inside and that uh, we are allowed the rule of six outside but we have to keep our distance and do that carefully um, it will be a communion service and the plan is that Jeff will leave. This is something that uh, my wife's been busy with, and I know that others have been busy making similar things, but you can see there hope and joy, which is what I will be thinking about in my Christmas messages. So today we'll be looking at hope, and then when it comes to the Christmas service, where we have the carol service on the Sunday, the 20th, um, we'll stray more into how hope springs into joy. But these have been made so that we can share them with our neighbours and send a little something round to them to share hope and joy of our Lord Jesus at Christmas with them. Maybe some will read it, they will use it, and they will remember how the coming of the Lord and the hope and joy he brings is the real reason we celebrate Christmas. So into the message. Um, today we want to concentrate on hope. As we've said, it is the first Sunday of Advent. Now, as we started with the four candles at the start, um, it is the season of many more things than this. I mean, it is the season to be jolly, so it goes the song, but it is the season of hope, peace, joy and love. Now, as always with Advent, there's for us a looking back and a looking forward. Um, for the Jews at the time, of course, they were waiting in faith and hoping that the promised Messiah would come. When Jesus did come, of course, we know they were under oppression again as they had been many times, this time at the hands of the cruelty of the Romans, who had taken over so much of the all the countries around the Mediterranean and beyond in some cases. They were waiting for a Messiah to deliver them. For us, we stand this side of the first coming of Jesus and his birth, his death, his resurrection, his return to heaven. But we look back with thankfulness and worship that Jesus did come, and he came as Emmanuel, God with us, the son of God, and came to save us, to be our saviour. But as we look back, we also, for believers in Jesus, we have this wonderful looking forward to that there's another advent. And like the Jews were waiting in faith and hope, we need to do the same. Because we have a sure and living hope that he is going to return. He's promised he will and he will take us to be home with him. And we will have the fullness of eternal life forever. So Advent is a season of hope and a season of looking forward for us today as much as it is a reflection looking back. I do want to start with something of the Christmas story before I delve more into hope itself, just quickly. Two people I want to mention. The first is Zechariah. I mean, you'll be familiar with the whole story, of course. Zechariah, the priest, and Elizabeth, his godly wife, they were now very old. They hadn't been able to have children. Zechariah goes into the temple and an angel appears to him and meets him with the greeting an angel normally had to, which was don't be afraid. And then says to Zechariah that God has heard their prayer. So here they are now in old age and they've been waiting and hoping for children. And maybe they had even given up hope. But God had a time and God had a plan. And he heard their prayer and revealed to Zechariah that the boy who was to be born was the one who was in the spirit of Elijah to come and prepare the way for the Lord. So Zechariah is probably the first person who actually knew that God was on the move and that the Messiah was coming very very soon then of course the angel gabriel appears to mary and mary goes and visits elizabeth and this is when elizabeth is six months pregnant and elizabeth as john the baptist joyfully uh, moves in her womb 
she says, why has the mother of the Lord, my Lord, come to visit me? And so Elizabeth is also knowing through the Holy Spirit now that the Messiah is to be born through Mary. So this family of Zechariah and Elizabeth, this godly family, have a really great privilege to be the first people who God spoke to that he was coming then. And of course, Mary knew and it was revealed to Joseph, the people who know this is coming. And then when the baby is born, John the Baptist is born, Zechariah praises because he has visited and redeemed his people just as he promised. The light is now shining. The waiting is still there for him to grow and deliver them. But hope is now rising as a flame in their hearts. And there's a great verse that's often quoted there from Isaiah at Christmas. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. I can't imagine the excitement, the anticipation, the joy that the light had dawned. The second person I want to talk about with regard to the first advent, which goes now beyond the birth. You remember the story in Luke 2? Jesus has been born. He needs to be taken and dedicated to the temple. So that's what Joseph and Mary do. And it's revealed to Simeon, this man who was righteous and divine, devout, who had been eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come. God, through the Holy Spirit, reveals to him and he takes Jesus up in his arms, full of joy because he has seen the sovereign Lord. He has that peace and joy in his heart, again mentioning that he is a light to reveal the glory of God and God to the people. But here he is. He had been eagerly waiting. And you see a great link between hope and faith and patience and waiting. These people had been trusting God, faithfully waiting for God to move and then have this great privilege of knowing and seeing the Messiah. And not to take time over Anna as well, but of course, Anna then comes, the prophetess, and she confirms everything that Simeon has said and is full of praise to God. And you can see now that as the hope is being realised, how hope is not just linked with waiting and patience and faith, but hope then is linked with praise and joy as we are relying on a God who will keep his promises. So what I want to do. As I think about hope, there's three things I want to do quickly. The first, I've put the impact of hope on this life. So what difference does hope or not having hope have on our lives now? At a human level, I want to suggest first that whether we have hope or not has a very significant impact on our spiritual health, our mental health. And because we're so linked as body, soul and spirit, even then on our physical health. Here's a verse from Proverbs that you might recognise. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And at some point in our lives, we will have experienced that, won't we? Something we were hoping for that didn't happen. People talk about their hopes being dashed. Some of us will experience what it's like to be lovesick and the feeling inside that that gives. And then if that love is not returned, how that makes you feel. But when we have a hope and that hope is fulfilled, think of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden and the tree of life that will come when our Lord comes back in Revelation. And what abundance that talks about, the abundance of joy and strength that a hope fulfilled brings. Many of you will recognise the other verse I put down, Isaiah 40. I've chosen the NIV because it uses the word hope. Other translations sometimes use the word trust or wait. So we could read, but those who hope, trust and wait in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So as we raise our eyes 
to the Lord and we wait in patient faith and hope and trust in him, we are able to rise above, not in our own strength. Our strength is renewed. We are stronger. Our spiritual health, mental health and physical health improve and are stronger. But in God's strength, we're able to rise above the problems and troubles that we face in this life. Thinking still about this life, a verse you may recognise from Ephesians chapter 2. Paul's pointing out to the Ephesians to remember where they were and where they are now in Christ. And he uses this expression that before they came to Christ, they were without hope and without God in the world. It's been a discussion I've had with a few people recently, either while myself and, and Buff have walked or with other people at work on our Christian fellowship. When there's so much going on with COVID and Christmas in Rolls Royce with people being displaced from their roles and possibly being told they're out of their work in January and have to leave and all the impact of stress that causes. It's difficult when you've been brought up perhaps in the Christian home, come to trust the Lord at an early age, to understand and appreciate what it must be like to live life without hope, to live life without God. And we were chatting the other day about whether people are actively atheists or agnostics or passively atheists or agnostics. But those who are actively atheists and would want other people to come to that view, they're leading them to a life that is without hope and by definition without God. And then you end up in the situation that Solomon describes in Ecclesiastes, but if all we have is life under the sun and that is it, life is meaningless. Life is like chasing the wind. Why would we want to chase after misery when this is all it is? And all of then the clinging on to life and concerns as we grow older and lose our human strength that that brings. Whereas trust in the Lord means that the inner man can be renewed day by day, even though the older man, our physical body, is fading away. And we have the surety of a hope in heaven. Brings you to the middle verse. One of the great verses of the Bible, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Like Paul, we cannot convince everybody that God is real, that God is the creator, that God has come and cared and loved but Paul says he is fully persuaded and this is what we have become isn't it through faith and through the grace of our Lord Jesus we have become fully persuaded our faith is not a blind faith it's a faith of substance it's a face of evidence that God is there God is real God is with us God is the God of character and hope who will keep his promises and it's in his character that we're trusting, knowing that he does not change. Like our first verse, knowing it is God's character, that he cannot lie. And we have come to trust in him. And faith and hope then are two sides of the same coin, almost completely linked together. In Ephesians 6, it talks about the armour of God. And Paul touches on that in First Thessalonians 5 as well. And he encourages us to put on as a helmet a hope of salvation what's a helmet for in the old armor the helmet was to protect the head from blows from blunt instruments swords axes whatever we are to put on the spiritual helmet the hope of salvation is to protect our minds is to protect our faith in the lord jesus and it is that hope of salvation that provides that protection for us. You might recognise the hymn I put at the end. It's a great hymn, isn't it? Great is thy faithfulness. I think my favourite line in it, perhaps, is where in the third verse it says, Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. That's the hope that the Lord brings us into this life. Hope for today. Strength for today and open strength for tomorrow.
the last one on this life. I'm not going to comment on this. You can see that pretty much all of those parts of hope, peace, joy and love come up in Romans 5. I'll just read it and let you listen and the Holy Spirit talk to your heart as we think about how this affects us in this life and how that hope that we have in God, it will never disappoint us. Paul says, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Again, it makes you wonder how people go through life without a hope like that. Moving on from this life. What about the next life? Life beyond death. We often think about the, it's at Easter, the great Easter chapter of resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. We're back to where we were with those who have no hope. If the hope is only going to stop at the grave, well, it's not a living hope. It's not an eternal hope. It's not a hope that really makes a significant difference. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And that's all the difference. We have our hope in a living Saviour who died for us. And not only brings us hope in this life, but has brought us to a living hope. A hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie has promised. This is a hope that is for this life and makes such a difference now, but ultimately and more gloriously makes a difference beyond this life, the hope of an eternal life with him. It means we can, again from Titus, we can now look forward to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. And we can look forward in confidence if it's for us to die and go to glory that way, we will still know the sting of death, but he has taken it away and we will be forever with the Lord. So we need not sorrow like those who have no hope. We still sorrow when we lose people, but we have hope that we will see our Lord in them again because he's coming back and the dead in Christ will be raised first and we that are alive and we have the opportunity today to still enjoy that hope that we will go alive and be transformed in the twinkling of an eye to be forever with the Lord without passing through death. But whichever way it is for us to be there, we will be forever with the Lord. Second one on this. Again, this is just a prayer, not really to comment too much but this is one of those great prayers of the apostle paul that it owes us to spend time to think about and to learn to pray about this was paul's prayer for the ephesians it's a prayer that we should pray for each other he says i pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope for which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. We will never understand the fullness of the glorious inheritance and his incomparably great power now. 
But Paul's prayer is that we will be enlightened to know him and to know this hope and that it will be strong in our hearts and lead us to share that hope with others and lead us to a more powerful life as Christians now, that we might experience how he says to the Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Last part. We've spoken about hope for this life, hope for life beyond life. But like those who were waiting for the Messiah to come the first time and the light dawned and they rejoiced it because their hopes were realised. What will it be for us when our hope in Christ is fulfilled? This is how Paul puts it in Romans 8. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. We believe has also grown. He's been talking about creation groaning. Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, but we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he's promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must make, wait patiently and confidently. There's a lot there. It's such a brilliant chapter. Are we waiting in eager hope? It's great to look forward to Christmas. It's going to be different this year with all of its problems and difficulties. The joy of children looking forward to Christmas is always special. The anticipation of looking forward to something. I often say to Samuel and Thomas that this is my favourite part of Christmas Advent rather than Christmas itself. I enjoy the anticipation, the carols, the looking forward, the things that you do only at this time of year. I enjoy Christmas Day, it's great, but it seems to pass so quickly and then it's done. But we are, are we waiting with that anticipation and eager hope for Jesus to come? And when he does come, it won't be over and done in a day. It's forever and forever. With Christmas, I, as I said, prefer the looking forward to. But I said to them the other day, when Jesus comes back, it's different. The looking forward to is great. But the looking forward to isn't better. When, how could I put this, when myself and, and Buff were seeing each other and we were going up and down the motorway between Cardiff and Derby, um, two things quickly to mention. One quite humorous, but I've still got them. She found them the other day, some old socks. Now I'm going to keep these old socks and I'm not going to throw them away. One sock says Monday, then there's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Of course, we will see each other at the weekend. On a Sunday or a Monday, we would go home. Then you'd get through the rest of the week. We used to jokingly call Wednesday Nasty Wednesday because it was the point in the middle when we were longest from seeing each other and the longest to seeing each other again. But Thursday was anticipation Thursday because Friday we were going to see each other. And that was that anticipation and excitement of hope. And a hope that wasn't flimsy, a hope that was real. We knew there was a life ahead together, which we still enjoy in God's grace. And then you have the anticipation of a wedding day. But just like when Jesus returns, the anticipation looking forward to the wedding isn't better than the event and the life to follow. It's the wedding and the life together that follow that matter and they eclipse the waiting. So here, being with Jesus is going to eclipse the waiting. Now we still need to hope for it, but when it comes, we won't need to hope for it anymore because it will be fulfilled. First Corinthians 13, what a lovely and famous chapter. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face.
Now I know in part. But then I shall know just as I also am known. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. What will it be? We can't imagine, can we? What God has prepared for those that love him. God has revealed them to us, Paul then goes on to say, through his spirit. But it's still as if it's in a mirror. It's dark. It's dim. One day it won't be. One day it will be face to face, face to face with Jesus. So as we think about Advent, it's the season of hope, peace, joy and love. But for today, I want to leave you with the thought of this. That when hope is fulfilled, that will be Jesus face to face. It will be perfect peace. It will be eternal joy. It will be pure and everlasting love. And so in our hearts, we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on him. As we think about Christmas, let's remember that the shadow of the cross is over the cradle. But let's lift our eyes. Let's keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus, the one who is the author of our salvation and faith, the one who is all of our hope. Just going to pray, then we've got a song and a blessing to finish. Father, we are again full of thankfulness, full of pondering and wondering, what will it be when the day comes and you say to your son, now all things are ready. And you send him to come into the heavens, call together his bride, those who are dead to be raised, those of us who are alive to join together in the clouds. Lord, we're not surprised, but we are in all. No servant is coming. No angel is being sent. Lord, you yourself are coming. It's your prayer that we be with you where you are. Zechariah had to wait all those years with Elizabeth for a baby to be born who will prepare the way for the first time you came. Lord, we can't understand with our human minds bound by time how we want to express it, that you are still waiting, yet when you're in eternity and time isn't there, we can't grasp it. But from our perspective, from where we are, you're still waiting for that prayer to be answered. But one day it will be forever with the Lord. And what a comfort that is. We thank you for the hope that you have given us through your spirit in our lives. We pray that that hope will burn brightly within us and lead us to more peace, more joy and more pouring out of your love through the Holy Spirit into our hearts and through us to others. That's as we pray now, as we head to concluding our time together and our time of conversation and fellowship together. We thank you for letting us be able to do this, for those who've been able to join. And we pray your blessing on us now as we're so full of gratefulness to the Lord. Until we see you face to face, we ask even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our closing song is Joy to the World. It's a choir version, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Thank you.
may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness Saw through the shadows of my soul The work is finished, the end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a Heart could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me.
is our home in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? Let our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart? From his coming, then what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing. Will have.